Praise the Lord, everyone. And I'm just going to invite Brother Reed to come and just to pray before we do anything else. Brother Reed, I sound like somebody else. But the Lord is good. Can we all stand as we pray, everyone? Eternal God and our Father, known unto you are all your works from the foundation of the world. There is no searching of your understanding, Lord. You are beyond comprehension at times, Lord. Your word said, Behold, thou art a God that hideth thyself. But Lord, night is like daylight to you, and nothing is hid from you. And so this day you knew every household that would be represented here by your divine orchestration, Lord. We are here. And Lord, we know your presence is here. We ask this very moment in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you walk through every aisle, every seat, from the back to the front, to the side. Let the canopy of your presence rain down an anointing that will heal heart. Hallelujah. You will rain down the anointing that will destroy every yoke of bondage, every relationship that's not healthy. Lord, destroy that yoke. Hallelujah. Everyone that's broken and needs healing right now, and those who are carrying a burden, Lord Jesus, that seems Oh God, as if it's impossible to undo it. You are God all by yourself. And this very moment we ask for your unction and your anointing on my wife, Lord, that your presence will be all over, Lord, that your word will go forth. And as it says, Lord, in your word, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing of son of soul and spirit joints and marrow and yes lord it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart even now let your great name be glorified let your power be great let your name be great and lord stand lord jesus in this place oh god set up a standard even now defend and fight deliver today we give you honor hallelujah we give you praise above every other name your name is glorified in jesus name thank you jesus thank you jesus you may be seated hallelujah so i want to add my voice to those who have already gone before to say happy mother's day to all our mothers our grandmothers and mothers-in-law right here in the micro gymnasium those viewing on facebook live and those who will be viewing the video on youtube later so we greet you all and we wish you a happy mother's day i greet everyone here in the name of the lord jesus christ amen all right, so pastor has asked me to speak today about grace from a female's perspective. That's easy to do because God has always been gracious to women. The hard part is doing it from up here, behind this microphone. <laughs> so I have everything written down. <laughs> 
Oh, God. So, before I begin, I would like to apologize to the men that this presentation is mostly geared to the women among us. However, it is hoped that what you hear will help you to relate to us more effectively as members of the body of Christ. I apologize too from now if I happen to say anything which may be seen as anti-male. It is not meant to be so. I have the highest regard and respect for men. I am married to one. <laughs> I am the mother of two boys. I do have a father. God has allowed me to be mentored by several men in leadership positions and has allowed me the privilege of interacting closely with several others. So nothing I say is meant to be disrespectful to men. Amen? <laughs> so, as Brother Anthony has taught us in recent Bible studies, I will be drawing some big circles first. <laughs> and then I will draw some smaller circles as it relates directly to us in this congregation. You may remain seated, but please turn with me to Genesis 1, 26 to 28, and Genesis 2, 20, 18 to 23. I'll be reading the New Living Translation, but please follow along in your Bibles. So that's Genesis 1, 26 to 28, and Genesis 2, 18 to 23. Genesis 1, 26 to 28 says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Genesis 2, 18 to 25, 23 says, Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still... There was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last, he, the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. If I should give a title to this presentation, it would be Who He Shaped Me To Be. But I rather like the titles that the media team usually comes up with, so you can either keep mine or you come up with one. <laughs> okay, so for the next few moments, I will attempt to paint a picture of what grace looks like to us as females. And what our response should be to such an amazing grace. In order to understand God's grace towards us, we need to understand the premium that he places on us. The extent to which we have been devalued historically by others and by ourselves. Why that has happened and God's response to it. Let's start at the beginning. So in the beginning, God created men and women as equals. In Genesis 1, 26 to 28, we read about God's creation and commissioning of humankind. Both men and women were created by God in his image and likeness. Both were blessed by him. Both were spoken to by him. And both were given certain commands. These commands were, 
be fruitful and multiply, to procreate. Subdue or govern the earth, to have dominion over the earth. And finally, reign over the fish, the birds, the livestock, all the wild animals and the small animals. Rule the animals. So Adam was not given a servant, but a helper that was just right for him. A companion that matched him and would join him to carry out purpose. That was the original. But then came sin. <laughs> so Adam and Eve sinned and each suffered consequences for sinning. The consequence that the woman suffers is captured in Genesis 3.16. And the Amplified Bible put it this way. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will give birth to children. Yet, your desire and longing will be for your husband. And he will rule with authority over you and be responsible for you. The meaning of the first part is obvious. We'll have great pain during childbirth. I remember when my sister had her first child. And when she came, we were at the hospital and she came out of the delivery ward and she says, Eve cause it. Is Eve cause it? Why should that? And I'm like, okay, yes. But Eve. <laughs> so we'll have great pain in childbirth. But there have been two main interpretations for the last part of the verse that speaks to women desiring and longing for their husband and the husband in turn ruling over them. The first interpretation is that as part of the consequence of sin, God implanted a particularly intense drive in females to want a husband and a family. This is seen as negative because many of us become so consumed with this desire that we live unfulfilled, discontent, half lives until this happens and continue to do so in the event it doesn't happen at all. In many societies and cultures, this, this desire for a marriage and children is the epitome of womanhood. You're not a woman without it. Otherwise, she is regarded and Eva regards herself as nothing. So if you're not married, if you don't have any children, you are nothing. That's what some societies and cultures believe. And that's something that we too, as women, sometimes believe. Another translation of Genesis 3 verse 16 is captured in the New Living Translation, which puts it this way. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy. And in pain, you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband. You will desire to control your husband. And, but he will rule over you. So the, <laughs> so the woman's desire here is interpreted as a desire to control her husband. And the husband's response to that attempt is to dominate the wife. As one writer puts it, what is really described in Genesis 3 verse 16 is the ugly conflict between the male and female that has marked so much of human history. Some call it the battle of the sexes. Who controls who? Who dominates who? Who is independent? Who is not? That is not God's way. That is sin's way. So apart from this direct consequence of sin in Genesis 3 verse 16, we will draw another big circle showing something else that causes women to be seen and treated as less than. So the first big circle, we are treated less than because God just tell you, say, that's going to happen because of sin. Now the other th thing now is, Genesis 1.27 states that God created male and female. In the Hebrew tongue, he created an ish, which is a male, and a female, which is a isha. <laughs> okay? Now, when he created the isha, 
he gave some attributes to the Isha that makes us female. This indicates <laughs> that there is a distinction in the human beings who God had created. Our current society would want this line, this distinction to be blurred. But amidst the controversy between what makes a man a man and a woman a woman, there are some research agreed on differences. Generally speaking, there are obvious physical and biological differences. For example, men tend to be physically stronger. And the way we are shaped is definitely different. Differences in other areas include, for the man, the man is explorative, love to explore children, especially boys, want to find out what a lizard doing and kill it. Determined to deliver the goods, men want to perform, they want to do well, needs to know what's next. So while a woman will just know what's happening today, the man wants to know what is happening Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The man is opportunistic. He's a go-getter, you know? He, is, he takes chances. He's, a, he's an initiator. He is active. And it is said that part of the brain that deals with aggression in the man is bigger. So the males are more aggressive because of biology, all right? They are competitive and they are dominant. So those are things that definitely God gave to the man. This has nothing to do with anybody else but God. Then the woman. The woman values intimacy above action. So she wants to sit down and have a conversation with you while you might want to get up and do something else. All right? Women are usually selective about their relationships. Because for this other reason, women seek security. So to a far greater extent than a male, she values qualities like dependability and trustworthiness in a potential mate. Because a woman is built by God to want security. God did that. Women, it is said, research, prefer modesty. A confident woman knows that she possesses something very precious and valuable. The power of her femininity. And she is driven by an innate desire to protect it. Modesty is fundamental to her nature. It is sin that causes females to go against that innate nature to be modest. Women are caring. The female is more naturally inclined to respond to the distressed, the needy, or the hurting with immediate compassion and care. The female uses words. Men talk to communicate information or ideas. Women talk to communicate feelings and thoughts. As a result, women tend to use more words than men. <laughs> women desire equity and submission. In other words, a woman wants to be a man's equal, but an equal in a very specific way. All right? At, at a deep and fundamental level, she has a strong desire to be led, protected, and cared for by men. <laughs> Women wield what is called the soft power which can shape humanity, soft power. Women have the ability to wield great and subtle influence in marriage and other relationships. So we may not do it like how the men do and dominate, but there's a way that a woman can get things done. It's called a soft power. Women are interconnecting. The female is wired to connect with others on many different levels. The woman trusts more easily. She conforms more easily. And she's idealistic, which means she has this thing in her mind and she, she wants it to work even if it is impossible. This also makes her more romantic. So the woman, the woman is, uh, you know, softer by God's design. So our God-given traits and by extension, the roles that they fit us for. So because we are natural carers, we become the nurses and the teachers and we are definitely the mothers even when a man tries to do it. 
you know, it does it his way. <laughs> All right. Um, so those are naturally God-given traits, and by extension, the roles they fit us for. It makes it easy for us to be perceived as weak in light of the man's more go-getting and dominant traits. So then, as a direct consequence of sin, and because of the traits that make us female, across the years, women have been viewed and treated as second-class citizens. One writer states that woman is defective and misbegotten. Another says when everything is working properly, a boy is born. But if something is wrong, a girl is born. Even some Christian theologians taught that motherhood alone is the highest calling for women. There's, you're good for nothing else. And that all women must embrace their role as women by bearing children. And if they do this in faith, then they will be saved. So sorry for you if you don't have a child, because according to these theologians, you're not going to make it. In the Old Testament times, it is said that the role of the woman always appears to be subservient to men and limited to certain roles. In that, she kept out of sight when visitors were present, like Sarah did when the angels came to visit Abraham. She served the men in the family before eating herself, fetched the water, made the clothes, cooked the food, walked while men rode. So some writers say that the image we have of Mary riding on the camel and Joseph walking beside her may very well be incorrect because women, it, he would be a laughing stock to be walking beside a woman who is riding a horse because a woman is really nothing. So she would be walking even if she's pregnant. So in the Jewish culture in the first century, the daily prayers of Jewish men included this prayer of thanksgiving. Praised be God that he has not made me a woman. And I need not speak of the modern day examples of how women are continuously treated as second class citizens. All because of the consequences of sin and the way that God shaped us to be. It is in the above context that we are able to see how gracious God is to women. In both Old and New Testament, God demonstrates that he values women as human beings made in his image and likeness. He elevates them to a place of respect not given to them by their contemporary societies, not limiting them to just the traditional roles in which they were assigned but demonstrating that he values them by using them to accomplish major tasks which affect the lives and courses of individuals and even nations. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's just lift our hands and just bless the Lord who is gracious, who is not limited by men's standards. Thank you. So we meet Deborah. Deborah is a judge. In Judges 4, Judges 4 describes her as a judge and a prophetess of Israel. The Israelites would go to her for judgment and she even accompanied Israel into one of its God-organized battles. Esther, from the book of Esther, who, used, who was used in her traditional role as a queen to accomplish a historical thing. The saving of the Jews, God's people, from being wiped out. When God was going to raise up a strong deliverer and judge of Israel, he appeared first to some, Samson's mother. Likewise with Jesus, he appeared first to Mary. And he used Anna, the prophetess, to confirm that indeed Jesus the Savior was born. Priscilla, who alongside her husband Aquila, did the work of a, ministry, a missionary. In Romans 16, 3-4, Paul refers to both of them as co-workers in Christ, stating that they both risked their lives for him and all the Gentile churches. Together, they are credited with instructing a major evangelist called Apollos by explaining to him the way of God more accurately. The couple is mentioned five times, and three out of the five times, Priscilla's name is mentioned first, 
it is thought that this speaks to her level of involvement and spiritual influence. I'm talking about the fact that God does not limit, he shows his graciousness to women by not limiting how he uses them. In contrast to how their society says that they should be used and they should be viewed. Then there is Lydia of Thyatira, mentioned in Acts 16. She's regarded as the first female convert in the area that we now call Europe. She is a well-to-do, respectable businesswoman, a seller of merchants of purple cloth whose heart God opened to the gospel, and in return, she was able to offer hospitality to Paul and his traveling companion. Then there is Phoebe, a first-century Christian woman mentioned by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans. She is thought to have been a deacon, having some leadership role in the church, who helps church members, including Paul, with her financial resources. So not only does God demonstrate that he values women by using them to accomplish his purpose, even if it means taking on roles that are not typically given to females, but he shows that he understands just who he made us to be using the very things about us that characterizes us as females for his glory. So it was Queen Esther's beauty, her submissive spirit, and hospitality that God used to give her favor with the king in order to save the Jews and punish Haman, an enemy of the Jews. It took a female named Jael to lure the king of Sisera, Israel's enemy, into her home to kill him. Fulfilling the prophecy that the Lord would deliver him into the hand of a woman, thus freeing the children of Israel from his tyranny. In 1 Samuel 25, we meet Abigail, who is described as a sensible and beautiful woman. She was also able to use her words persuasively, something females are said to be gifted with, to prevent the males in her household, including her husband, from being slaughtered by David because of the ignorant and arrogant behavior of her husband. Her wisdom and her persuasive words prevented David from doing something he shouldn't have done. As a female, she understood the need to be compassionate and hospitable to David and his men, as well as how to approach him with gifts, acknowledging his power and his authority, thus saving her household. And in Joshua 2, we are told the story of Rahab. I can't leave out Rahab. Rahab is a prostitute from Jericho who was able to hide the Israelite men sent out by Joshua to spy out the land. It is because she was a female that she could have accommodated the men without getting into serious trouble. Because she was a woman that soldiers easily believed her words that the Israelite men had already left her house. And there is Tamar. Tamar, the Lord had killed her first two husbands. And uh, they were Judah's sons. He had, and according to Jewish law, her father-in-law should allow her to be married to his next son. Their first child would be considered to be her husband's son uh, to, for his legacy to live on. Her father-in-law, though, withheld the third son from her. So she came up with a plan to act as a prostitute so her father-in-law would be intimate with her, producing a son in the name of her first husband. This may cause us to raise our eyebrows, but Tamar, along with Rahab, are listed in the genealogy of Joseph, who is Jesus' earthly father. She didn't fight fire with fire. She used something only a female could use to gain justice for herself. So, God shows us that he values us by using us, not just men, to accomplish his will. But it doesn't stop there. It gets even more personal when Jesus' ministry began on earth. Jesus continued to model God's graciousness towards women by firstly addressing and interacting with women in public, allowing them into his personal space. This was a no-no in the first century Jewish church society, especially that some of the women he chose to allow in his personal space were less than honorable women. 
In John 4, he spoke to the Samaritan woman who had had several husbands. In John 7, while he was in the house of a religious leader, he allowed a woman who was a known sinner to wipe his feet with perfume and her tears and her hair. In John 8, he spoke to the woman who was taken in the very act of adultery. In Luke 8, he allowed the woman who had a bleeding disorder to touch him and receive healing. For a woman to be bleeding, if she's seeing her time of month, if there's anything wrong with her, you are not even supposed to be anywhere near anybody. Much less touch a teacher, much less touch a male. And Jesus allowed her to touch him. Jesus was not afraid to interact with any of these women publicly. He looked beyond their faults, seeing their needs, never embarrassing them, never being afraid to acknowledge them. That's the graciousness of God towards women. Thank you, Jesus. Not only did he acknowledge women publicly, but he showed his regard for their intrinsic value or for the intrinsic value of the female creations in how he spoke to them and how he spoke about them he used his words to show the respect he had from them in the midst of a society that saw them as unimportant in luke 13 16 jesus in justifying why he chose to heal on the sabbath the woman who had been bent over for 18 years he called her a daughter of abraham the title son of Abraham was often used to indicate that a male Jew was recognized and bound by covenant to God. So to call the widow a daughter of Abraham was giving the woman a spiritual status equal to that of the man. He was showing the Pharisees that this woman was every bit as worthy as any one of them to the extent that he would break the Sabbath to heal her. She was valuable. In John 8, Jesus, in addressing the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, called her woman. And as we have learned from other previous presentations in this pulpit, woman is a title of dignity. It is a formal mode of speech equivalent to the English titles lady or madame. Imagine Jesus calling a female caught in such an embarrassing state, worthy of death according to the Jewish law, calling her by such a title of dignity in public, irrespective of what other people thought about her. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus knows that we are valuable. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. In that society, spirituality only belonged to men. The women would perhaps teach their children at home, but only the men were allowed to go into certain places in the synagogue and, and regarded as spiritual leaders. But in Luke 10, 38 to 44, G it, it highlights Jesus' acceptance and blessing of Mary's desire to learn about spiritual matters. Interestingly, interestingly, her sister Martha thought that Jesus would support her in reprimanding Mary for not helping her with the traditional and expected role of a female. The New Living Translation puts it this way. Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. So she came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. And yes, that's something else about us. There is only one thing worth being concerned about mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her jesus also included women in the revelations he made about himself he revealed to the samaritan woman that he was indeed the messiah he revealed to martha that he is the resurrection and the life 
and women were the first witnesses that he had indeed been raised from the dead. His male disciples were told about the resurrection by the women. And in Acts 2, Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, reminded the Jews that their sons and daughters would prophesy and the Lord would pour out his spirit on both men and women alike. What am I saying? That God gets us as females. He understands us. He made us and he knows exactly what he put into us as females. He knows what his original plans and purpose for us are. And so, though we bear the consequence of the sin Eve committed, he has consistently demonstrated how he feels about us and how he expects us to be treated. Why? Because he is wooing us back to him to make him the center of our lives. Because he knows us, he alone can make us the best of who we are as a collective group called females and as individual females with specific giftings and callings. When we surrender to him, he uses this femaleness and our unique giftings and callings to become the best of who we can be. When we don't make him Lord of our lives, our sinful nature takes over and we become the worst that we can be. This includes becoming the negative stereotypes that we have been assigned in society. All the nasty and degenerate things we can be. The gossipers, the nagging wife, the slanderers, the catfighters, the lesbians, the peniners who are malicious and provoking, the Delilahs who, are, who use our femininity to deceive and trap men, the Jezebels who are manipulative and domineering, ruling our husbands, leading them away from godly ways, evil, haters of God, doing whatever it takes to get our own way. The Rebecca's who try to manipulate the outcomes in our children's lives by deceiving our spouses. Or even Sarah who tried to take things into our own hands by giving Hagar to Abraham. We can become the lascivious women who through our dress, our speech, our mannerisms deliberately provoke lustful desires in men. When we don't surrender to him our femaleness. Thank you Jesus. But if we follow him and allow him to be the center of our lives, he uses the same femaleness to make us the best of who we can be. We can be like Abigail and Rahab and Esther, beautiful, physical, attractive women who behaved wisely, saving their families and nations. Wise like Naomi, an older woman who combined her knowledge about the laws of her country about male behavior and the power of femininity to ensure she gained a husband for Ruth, her non-Jew daughter-in-law, and by extension ensuring that they were both well taken care of for the rest of their lives. We can be persistent like Hannah, who wouldn't stop praying until she got the desire, her heart's desire from the Lord. We can be determined like the widow in Jesus' story, where she, who wouldn't stop going to the judge until he addressed her and she had her needs met. We can be reflective and accepting of the will of God like Mary, who hid in her heart the information God gave her about her son until it was appropriate to speak about it. We can be patient in suffering like her as well, as she watched her son suffer an unjust and cruel death on the cross. We can be bold like the daughters of Zelophehad, in Numbers 27, these females, five daughters of the, the man called Zelophehad, he had died. And according to Israelite law, women don't inherit land. And the Israel was about to divide up the land in the promised land. And they weren't about to get any. These five women decided to come before the entire council of Israel, the whole Israelite nation, and talk to them about the fact that their father was dead, they had no brothers. They would not get any property. Moses took the matter to God and God said, yes, they are right. You need to give them some land. As a result of their boldness, God created a new law in Israel as it relates to females inheriting property. That's what God can do when you allow him to use you as a female. 
You can be like the Syrophoenician woman, a non-Jew, whose love for her daughter caused her to boldly approach Jesus, thus receiving something from Jesus that was out of season. We can be courageous and fearless like Deborah, the judge of Israel. What's his promise to us? One of the things he promises us as females when we allow him to be in control of our lives is security. That is one of the dominant needs of females to have security in relationships. This we listed earlier, yes, as one of the things that characterizes us as females. The need for security in our relationships, especially in our relationships with men. Most of the time when you see a female going through, it's because something went wrong in a relationship that she had with some man. So God is saying to us, I want to be your security. God made us with the default. He was the one who made us like that. He made us to find our security in a strong masculine presence. And this makes us very vulnerable to exploitation. We are always looking for that security. So he offers himself to us in the very roles that we look to men for, for security. As daughters, we look to our fathers. As sisters, we look to our brothers. As wives, we look for it in our husbands. As mothers, in our sons. As unattached females, in, we look for it in the males around us with whom we try to create attachments. That's how God made us. Forever looking for that knight in shining armor. Which is why he wants us to turn to him first. Because he knows that this desire makes us vulnerable. And he being that kind of God wants to protect us. He offers himself to us as our first husband. So he declares himself as that. He wants us to find in him or to find him before we seek it in anyone else. The kind of security that comes from the intimate relationship that a husband shares with a wife. In the book of Hosea, he compares his relationship with the children of Israel to that of a husband whose wife keeps going after other lovers, then realizes that the satisfaction she, ought, she sought in other relationships could only come from the original husband. So it says, she will pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them. She will seek them, but she will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband, for it is better for me than no. Similarly, in the church, we are referred to as the bride of Christ. As a member of the church, he is our bridegroom. He wants to establish that kind of closeness and intimacy with us. If we don't make him our first husband, we're going to continue seeking after this security in incorrect ways. And before we meet our earthly husbands, if we can make God our first husband, building that intimacy with him, then our earthly husbands are going to be very happy to receive us. Thank you, Jesus. And he also declares himself to be our father. In Luke 11, Jesus, in modeling to his disciples how we should pray, begins by establishing our relationship to God as our father. Again, Jesus speaks of God in the role of father when he says, You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Psalm 103 verse 13 says, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. One songwriter calls him a good, good father. The security that we desire in a relationship with an earthly father, God wants to give that to us. Then as a son, Jesus demonstrates that he understands the security a woman finds in her son especially in the absence of a husband. 
and provides an example of how earthly sons should treat their mothers. In John 19, when he was on the cross, he saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved. He said to her, dear woman, here is your son. And he said to this disciple, here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his house. He took care of his mother. That's a security that women look for in their sons. Jesus also submitted to the request of his mother when she asked him to do a favor at a wedding. This led to him performing his first recorded miracle. As the son of God, he submitted himself to the death of the cross to provide a security in God for those he intends to save. He is the perfect son. As a brother, Jesus becomes our brother when we do the will of the Father. In Matthew 12, Jesus asked, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and said, Look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. He knows the value of the brother-sister relationship and so declares that kind of closeness to us when we do the will of the Father. Psalm 17 confirms this expected closeness with a brother when it states that a brother is born to help in time of need. In the King James Version, he said, it says a brother is born for adversity. Psalm 18, there are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. A brother is supposed to be close to you and provide security and covering, as seen in Genesis 24, when two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, misguidedly murdered the entire tribe of the two men who had raped their sister, Dinah. Similarly, Absalom, David's son, tried to avenge the rape of his sister Tamar by her half-brother Ammon. Jesus wants to give us that security that we can find in a brother. He is an awesome male friend. He knows how to be a good friend. He was close to Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. He was the one that Mary and Martha turned to when Lazarus fell ill. He had several other female friends and followers who were loyal to him. A woman's loyalty is not easily given. So it says a lot about Jesus that women followed him even to death. He can be our trusted male friend. The areas that women look to men for security, God is saying, look to me for that kind of security first. Thank you, Jesus, because he wants to protect us, because he made us and understands that we look for security in men. So finally, borrowing the words of Rick Warren, he said that it is inaccurate to say that we can become anything that we want to be. You know, you know, we always hear it, you can become anything you want to be. He said it is more accurate to say we can become everything that God shaped us to be. We can't become singers if our natural ability is not to sing. So therefore, you really can't be everything we want to be. But what, what is it that God has placed in you? Then you can become everything that God shaped you to be. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As females... Let's throw ourselves on the one who understands us. The one who gets us because he made us. The good news to women is that there is a perfect man in whom there is no variableness nor change. Who is dependable, compassionate, a defender, a healer, a burden bearer who gave himself for us who understands our deepest emotions, who values us, who will never leave us nor forsake us, who is approachable. Women were never afraid to approach Jesus, 
even in the worst situations, even in the public where they would have been rejected by others, they were never afraid to approach Jesus. He is approachable. He who doesn't disrespect us, he understands our vulnerabilities. He invites us to come to him in our mess, in our worst state. He understands our need to be attractive. He understands we desire male companionship. He understands that we don't want to be locked into a box of stereotypes and to be treated less than. He understands that we are shaped in a particular way as females and there's nothing we can do about that. But he wants to transform us into his image so we can become worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. That our beauty will come from within rather than focusing on the external adornments. God deals with any kind of woman, from any situation, from all walks of life. He deals with the queens and he deals with the judges and the prophetesses and the prostitutes and the housewives and the widows and the single women, the married women, the mothers, the daughters, the sisters, the friends, the unknown women, women with no names, Woo. women that were outcasts, women who according to society he had no business dealing with. Women who were not of the chosen people. Hagar was an Egyptian. Ruth was a Moabitess. Rahab, a Canaanite woman. The Syrophoenician woman. The woman at the well was a Samaritan. All from nations that were Israel, the chosen people's enemies. So even if you think you have no right to approach him, let his track record speak for itself. Thank you, Jesus. And for those of you who are indifferent and don't think that we need him, Revelations 3, 18 to 20, I know all the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me. Gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me. So you will not be ashamed by your nakedness. And ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. God has demonstrated his grace to us. The goodness of God, the grace of God, leads us to repentance. It's difficult to see how much he cares for us and want to make the best of who we can be, and then we walk away from him. Seek him first. Let him take your hurt. Let him take your needs. Let him take your desires, and let him transform you into the woman you are shaped to be.